question then. Um, well, thanks, Ross. It's good to be here amongst uh, amongst the economists. They call economics the dismal science. I'm here to tell you that my discipline is much more dismal and much less scientific. <laughs> there are no graphs. Um, and what I want to do is just very quickly uh, put uh, a long-term frame and a geopolitical frame around the economic crisis. Uh, that we're working with at the moment. It's very risky to predict in the middle of a crisis, but I think I venture to view that the historians will see what we're going through at the moment as marking an important step in the way in which the international order changes in response to China's growing strategic weight. And it does that both because the long-term consequences seem likely to need to accelerate the economic power shift that's been going on now for some decades, and also that the crisis and the management of that crisis has brought more sharply into focus the way in which that shift in economic weight is shifting the way the world works and rendering less credible what was always to me a pretty incredible proposition, and that is that the international order could somehow swallow a risen China whole without fundamentally changing its shape. And when I say that the order seems likely to change its shape, I'm not just talking about new forums. Obviously, the emergence of groups like the G20 and the concept of the G2 is itself a very significant indicator of these trends. But I'm talking about much more than different kinds of meetings with different participants. I'm talking about the order, the basic way in which they relate, which underlies it. And in thinking about the significance of China's rise and the way in which the present crisis affects it on that order, we've got it. it's very important to bear in mind that the order we're moving from has been both an extraordinarily <coughs> successful one, or almost, I think, at least in Asia, uniquely successful in history, and terribly simple. That is based on US primacy. And it's no slight to China to say that, speaking as an Australian at least, I'm sorry to see the US-led, US-dominated order go, but not only has it been very good for Asia and very good, I think, for the world, but it's been fantastically good for Australia. And it's not clear what follows. Now, the model that we've tended to have, the model that the international order would somehow swallow China whole without changing shape, has been most vividly and authoritatively reflected um, by Bob Zellick in that marvellous phrase, responsible stakeholder. That phrase to me always raised a lot more questions than it answered, in particular responsible to whom? And how did the idea of a responsible stakeholder as applied to China distinguish China from every other country in the international system? Is a responsible stakeholder what would expect of every other what would we expect of every other country? <coughs> it seems to me that one way of describing what we're seeing at the moment is the point at which that phrase responsible stakeholder has simply ceased to be credible. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the Rudd government's new defence white paper, which I'll come back to in a second, used a phrase mm -hmm. leading stakeholder, which sounds to me closer to it. Um, and it's one way of framing it, which is how you flesh out the kind of leadership <coughs> that China might end up adopting. Well, partly to see the urgency of that, it's helpful to pull back a step. <coughs> Power is a very complex thing in the international system. It's got many dimensions. There are some of those dimensions have to do with ideas, the soft power. Some of them have to do with armed force, the hard power. But I just make the pretty obvious observation that the hi history suggests that the most fundamental form of power in the international or in the international system is economic power. It's hardly a coincidence that global strategic primacy has tended to follow economic primacy very closely throughout the modern era. The United States became the biggest economy in the world in about 1880, and its uh, position as a dominant strategic player globally followed pretty swiftly. And it's in that context that, to me, the most significant sentence in our new white paper, this is defense, this Australian defense white paper, is the one in paragraph 4.23 that says that on some measures China could overtake the United States to become the biggest economy in the world by 2020. Now, it's an early date, it might be later, but uh, that seems to me the thing which is really driving 
the transformation we're talking about. It's not that the US doesn't have other sources of power. The US will remain for long after 2020 the biggest single military power in the world. So I think it's easy to overestimate the significance of that, even on the straight military terms. China will not be a symmetrical military competitor with the United States for as far ahead as any of us can be bothered looking. But it is already in a position to challenge in strict operational terms the military basis of American privacy in Asia because it's already in a position to challenge America's capacity to deploy carriers and amphibious forces in the woods in the Western Pacific, raising the cost of risk for the United States of doing that, primarily by the improvement in its submarine capability. Likewise, America will retain, of course, a very strong position globally as a marketplace for and a generator of ideas of all kinds. But I do think that the most the surest indication of China's future strength, the risk of sounding self-interested as an academic, is China's immense investment in education. And I do think we've moved a long way from, very quickly we've moved a long way from the point that George Bush could articulate in 2003 when he said there's only one universally valid model for a successful society in the 21st century. That seems like a long time ago. So the question is, what will China do with its power? The first thing, of course, is that it's not going to rock the boat. China has an immense interest in oil. But the difference is that we have no reason to assume that the order that China believes that that order has to be based on exactly the same distribution of power and authority as the one we've moved from. China, I'm sure, has a view of a stable order in which it plays a significantly bigger role. And there's nothing wrong with that. Why should China not seek that? I would say she seeks at least equality with the United States in the way that order works. And quite probably would strongly prefer some form of leadership. The form of that leadership is a very interesting question, but there are lots of forms of leadership that China could adopt in a global order which would not necessarily be incompatible with that order being stable and prosperous and as congenial to the rest of us as the order we've lived with for the last 40 years. It would just be different. But any conception like that brings, will bring China into what seems to me like a very sharp competition with very deeply embedded American expectations. America does have a choice as to how it responds to China's growing power, whether it chooses to compete with China to preserve the primacy, which has been the foundation of global order for so long, or whether it concedes a measure of power to China and accepts and is prepared to negotiate a new kind of order. The Bush administration described China a few years ago as a country at a strategic crossroads, and of course it is. But, but so is America. That choice for America is very profound. In the end, it boils down to a choice between preserving its primacy and preserving stability. For America, that hasn't in the past been a choice. <coughs> stability, its primacy has been a foundation of stability. In the future, that might not be as simple. So China, America's choices are as important as China's. The good news is that there's lots of incentives to get it wrong. That there's a chance of a slow, steady, sensible, mature, rational accommodation between the US and China, and eventually other countries, but between those two at first, which will see the emergence of a new stable order. And it may well be that the crisis that we're going through at the moment will be seen as a point at which they started to cooperate effectively to, to bring that about. The other bit of good news is that the flashpoints that might violate that process appear at the moment to be reasonably manageable. Taiwan certainly is probably looking more manageable, less threatening than it took for a long time. I don't regard that as a permanent and irreversible trend, but it's certainly welcome to it as far as it goes. And North Korea, for all the problems that North Korea poses, is at least an issue upon which US and Chinese interests and objectives appear broadly to converge. But there is some bad news. One question in my mind is whether the changes that will occur in the US economy and the Chinese economy and the way they interact as a result of the global financial crisis and a wind away from the global financial crisis will not weaken the basis of economic integration which is so important in the stabilising their relationship here too. 